Okay, in this final video of the series, we'll be reading chapters 3, 4, 5, and 6 of part 2 of Tsubochi Shoyo's Shousetsu Shinzai. Part, uh, chapter 3 of part 2, Constructing a Plot. A novel is the product of it, its author's imagination. It follows that unless he takes meticulous care in planning the construction of its plot, he will end up with a collection of ideas haphazardly thrown together in an attempt at realism, his storyline disrupted by sequential confusion, and his portrait of human nature, Ninjo, obscured by lack of con continuity. The cause and effect relationship may be masked by an overabundance of incidents, and a satisfactory conclusion impeded by the presence of too many characters. All these factors naturally make it vital that he construct his plot in accordance with a predetermined set of rules. So underline rules here again. He's bringing in this idea of uh, having to abide by a certain predetermined set of rules. And notice that he uh, warns against including too many characters in the no in one's true uh, modern novel. Uh, this is to be contrasted with the Sharebon, for example, of Santo Kyoden, which has which are fairly short in length. They're only 20, 30 pages or so, but they usually have 30, 40, 50 characters who appear and then disappear, and then another set of characters will appear and disappear. And he's uh, advising against this. Continuing, he writes, It is essential when writing a novel to preserve a clear and logical sequence so that all incidents, major and minor alike, are connected and not left dangling. So there should be causal connection between the two. The, uh, it should be clear which events of the story are constitutive, constitutive events that are necessary to the plot, and those, and those that are not should be clear as well, are connected and not left angry. In true stories, travel sketches, and the like, the events related are essentially not fictitious, and so the constant re introduction of new topics and switches in the focus of the story give the reader the feeling of watching scenery pass by from a moving carriage. The events of the earlier part of are forgotten halfway through, and with them the prospect of discovering their outcome as the story switches to completely unrelated matters. New characters are introduced without the predecessor's fate being fully explained. Okay, again, you see this a lot in Sharebon, another Gesaku fiction of the Edo period. The sequence of the whole book is disconnected. One of the most cursory, only the most cursory attention is paid to continuity. A novel, on the other hand, a true novel, a modern novel, and his uh, the kind that he's advocating, must be consistent. No story in which there is no connection between beginning and end, no relationship between cause and effect, can be called a novel. Okay, so this is a very different idea of the novel than the, uh, say, the makimono of the pre-modern period when events are not necessarily causally related. In Genji Monogate, for example, the, all the plots don't lead causally to the next scenes and plots and so forth. So he's arguing against the, the uh, broader tradition of Japanese literature here. Uh, it can be called a novel. It is no more than a, an absurd piece of fiction. Such works that are not causally connected and consistent are no more than an absurd piece of fiction, similar to but different from a faithful, factual account of social conditions. Bakking had this to say about rules in the novel, and he quotes here a long passage from Bakking. There are, are, of course, structural rules to be seen in the works of Chinese novelists of the Yuan, Yuan and Ming dynasties. They use the techniques of rule gradation, adumbration, prearrangement, parallelism, contrast, abbreviation, and illusion. And remember that uh, Bakin modeled many of his uh, Yomihon uh, works on these Shosetsu of the Ming dynasty. And I should also note, I've mentioned a few times in previous videos, that the word that uh, Shoyo in this essay is applying the word Shosetsu, which in Japan is a relatively new word that doesn't uh, appear on the scene until the 18th century. He's using this word to refer to uh, uh, most prose genres, or all prose genres of Japanese literature, dating all the way back to antiquity. And this usage of the word shosetsu is relatively new. In the 18th century, when the word shosetsu came into Japan, it referred explicitly to 
the uh, sort of lowbrow fiction of the Ming Dynasty in China, and also to uh, the Yomi Hon, which were written by Bakin and so forth, and other writers in imitation of those Ming Dynasty works. So the Shosetsu in the 18th century, in the 19th century, had a very specific meaning, and Shoyo is uh, sort of discarding that original meaning and applying it very broadly. And I should note that this point is made in uh, the work by Licentious Fictions, a work that recently came out by Daniel Polk, Polk, I think it's pronounced, uh, called Licentious Fictions, Ninjo in the 19th century Japanese novel. So if you're interested in how this word Ninjo evolves over time, how the Ninjo bone extend, expanded or extended uh, through the Edo period into the Meiji period, and sort of uh, was transferred into the, transformed into the modern novel, and how it sort of continues, elements from the Ninja Bon continue into the modern novel. Uh, read his work, which is quite excellent. I highly recommend it. Okay, continuing with the Bakin quote and allusion. These are the techniques used by the Chinese novelists of the Yuan and Ming dynasties. Continuing, Bakin writes, role gradation is a Kin to the shite and the waki of recent no no plays, no dramas. In Chinese novels, the protagonist, deuteragonist, the waki is the deuteragonist, right, the secondary character. Protagonist is the shite. These are uh, no theater terms. In Chinese novels, the protagonist and deuteragonist relationship may remain constant throughout or change with each chapter. Occasionally, the roles may be reversed. Adumbration and pre-arrangement resemble each other, but are not the same. The former involves hinting at, at events, several characters before they occur, several chapters before they occur. Sorry. The latter laying foundation, something known these days as preparation, arranging the beginnings of things in such a way as to yield a clever plot. Jing Dui used this technique in his commentary on the Shui Zhuang, which has already been referenced above. Uh, Jin De Ri writes, Parallelism is also known as comparison. It means that, like parallelism, parallelism in verse, two things are compared with each other and paired off in the plot. While it may seem redundant, it is not. Redundancy occurs when the author makes the mistake of repeating an event similar to an earlier one. Earlier one. Parallelism involves making both a deliberate parallel and a comparison with the earlier part of the story. Funamushi Obanai's death on the horns of a cow, for example, parallels the fighting bulls of Hokuetsu Niju Song. Inukai Genpachi's struggle on the boats moored in the Senju River, on the other hand, is contrasted to the struggle on the roof of the Horyu Kaku. Although this particular contrast and comparison resemble each other, they are different. The comparison compares ox to ox, two animals in different situations, whereas the contrast involves the same person in two different situations. Continuing, uh, Bakin writes, Abbreviation is a device used to reduce the quantity of text to avoid tedium. By making someone overhear something he has to know, or having a character explain something in place of a description by the author, it is meant to shorten the story and prevent the readers from becoming bored. Allusion is the suggestion of a deeper meaning than the words spell out. Allusions require considerable hindsight to understand. Shui Hu Zhuang is full of them. Allusions. Nobody has ever been able to explain them satisfactorily, though many Chinese men of letters, including, of course, Li Zhi and Jing Ri, have toyed with them. Okay, end quote. The first of Bakin's rules... The protagonist deuteragonist, deuteragonist relationship, I intend to discuss at length in a separate chapter. What I have to say here concerns the other six. Okay, so now uh, Shoyo offers his commentary on the other six of Bakin's seven rules, starting with adumbration and pre arrangement. Adumbration and pre arrangement are merely factors in preserving the logical sequence I mentioned earlier. Most Oriental scholars in the past, despite their erudition and retentive memories, were able to sum up broad concepts in a name. They picked out and named individually the characteristics of certain sections. Both adumbration and prearrangement are meant to ensure a smooth, connected plot and do not merit separate classification. 
Okay, so we'll have to look up uh, later what these uh, set these the original Japanese terms are for these uh, seven rules: uh, adumbration, prearrangement, comparison, contrast, and so forth. See what terms Shoyo is using to give us a better idea of what he's talking about. Comparison and contrast are too contrived to pursue this sort of long-winded novelty too enthusiastically might perhaps result in a distortion of that description of human nature, ninjo, and social conditions, setai, which are the novel's main concerns. So again, he's repeating his formula of what the novel's main concerns are, namely human nature and social conditions. These two are techniques for Chinese writers, to whom style is all important. Japanese writers need not employ them. So once again, we're in this context of Datsua, where Japan's moving away from China and away from the worldview that sees China as the center of the universe, and it's in, uh, moving toward a new worldview that has the West as uh, center, and Japan is associating itself with the West here, and therefore saying that we need to, we no longer need to um, see style as all important, which is all important to the Chinese. It's again making a a distinction between uh, the new Japanese uh, culture and Chinese culture with which it has been associated in the past. Abbreviation I shall discuss in a separate section on the principles of description. Allusion can hardly be said to be uh, essential. Okay, allusion is no longer essential. Remember, we've already read many works from early modern Japanese uh, <clears throat> literature, medieval Japanese literature, classical Japanese literature, and allusion, allusion is absolutely essential, right? We see honkadori in poetry, honshidori uh, in the context of kyoshi, wild China, syndetic poems. Uh, in fiction as well, allusion is absolutely essential. We saw it in Chikamatsu's plays. We seen it in Matsu Obasho's uh, haibun, prose, po uh, travel dialogues, and so forth. But Shoyo here is saying that illusion is no longer essential. We no longer need to make references to works of the past. Any story which gives a faithful description of human nature and social conditions, Ninjo Sedai, and moves the reader to admire its elegance, constitutes a novel regardless of whether it possesses any profound extra-textual significance. Okay, this is a very key passage. It had a, an enormous effect. Although I should say that Japanese literature probably would have moved in the same direction of anti-allusivity, regardless of whether he wrote this treatise, uh, since that was sort of the, the zeitgeist, uh, the, the general direction in which Japan was headed at the time. But this is such an important quotation here that I'm going to copy and add it to my book. Hold on one second, take a little short break. As failure to do so is, no, is in no way detrimental to the novel, to imply a second not immediate, obvious level of meaning in any work other than an allegory is no more than a conceit of the author, a labor of love. Its presence or absence is immaterial. Okay, so illusion is permissible, but it's not necessary, is what he's saying. We need not focus on it anymore, he's saying. As I have already said in my introduction to this section, the sole purpose of rules in the novel is to keep the reader interested. So if the illusions keep the reader interested, then fine, put them in there. If not, just get rid of them. Once this is clearly understood, no more detailed explanation is necessary, but I shall nevertheless press on for the future benefit of our own authors, who as yet possess only a rudimentary knowledge of such matters. So again, he's treating Japanese writers as sort of primitive um, writers that are, in, are who are in need of civilization, which he is providing by writing this. Treaties. The first thing to be dealt with in any discussion of plots is the difference between comedy and tragedy. Okay, so he's taking these ideas that come from the West, sort of uh, kigeki and uh, higeki in Japanese, and he's sort of forcing them onto the Japanese tradition. They don't really fit, right? Because Japanese tradition is not really divided into these two categories of comedy and tragedy, and they don't divide plot in these ways. But nevertheless, he's saying we should divide plot in these ways from now on, going forward. Uh, tragedies and comedies may be called in Japanese hi ai shosetsu. Okay, hi ai is the word for uh, tragedy, right? Hi, higeki no hi, and ai is a kanji, not love, a different kanji. And kai katsu shosetsu, respectively. Kai katsu, I think it's the high kai, it's the kai of high, meaning comedy here. Kai katsu shosetsu. The tragic novel, Hiai Shosetsu, I have already touched on in the first section of this work. 
A comic novel or kaikatsu show sets it restricts itself to light-hearted matters and abounds in jokes and witticisms. So the, note that this is the same kai of haikai no kai, right? So you might be able to say that haikai is sort of a um, prototype of his idea of the kaikatsu show. So it's a, a comic novel restricts itself to light-hearted matters and abounds in jokes and witticisms. The comic novel of today is vastly different from that of the days when... That when what then passed for comic novels attempted to hold society up to ridicule by depicting only laughable, ludicrous antics. Besides not always aspiring primarily to jokes and puns, it sometimes even incorporates into its plot a dash of pathos. Hakkenden and Yumi Harizuki provide examples of modern comedies on the home front. There's a note about that. Uh, the first work, obviously, by Bakin, I think the second is as well. The final scene in a comic novel finds the hero safe and prosperous. So he's applying the, the definition of the comic novel, of the comic play uh, on the Japanese, uh, namely the definition of the comedy is that it begins with some sort of tension or problem and it ends with a happy ending, as opposed to the tragedy which ends with the fall or the death of the characters, main characters. The final scene in a comic novel find, finds a hero safe and prosperous. In a tragedy, however, he meets an untimely death as the end approaches. Modern novelists, to avoid monotony, occasionally spice even tragic novels with jokes or cheerful topics so that there is no longer any clear-cut distinction between tragedy and comedy. Many so-called comedies in particular, are not, in particular are not funny at all. That is why a certain English scholar not long ago styled Novels like Hakken Den and Yumi Harizuki as tragic, tragic comedies. Hikigeki in Japanese, I think, is the word for that. Uh, and the description is probably apt. I'm not sure who the English scholar is who referred to Hakken Den in that manner. The one thing to be avoided above all else in a purely comic novel is a pornographic plot. So again, he's uh, denouncing pornography and uh, overt sexuality here. Sometimes authors with little self-respect stoop to obscenity to raise a laugh when hard-pressed for humorous material. Witness Ikkuz uh, Hiza Kurige. Okay. This is Jippen, Jippensha Ikku, the famous Gesaku writer of the... Um, Edo period, who penned what is probably the most famous of all the Gesaku works, Hiza Kurige, and there's an English translation of that work too, we can look at that later. And also Kinga Shichi, Kinga's Shichi Henjin, there's a footnote about that, we'll look at that later. Both of which are outstanding among pre-restoration, pre-major restoration novels, but fall short of the standards of the true novel because of their high content of body dialogue. Right. Uh, dialogue should not be too body in the new novel. Okay, so these works are successes uh, according to the old standards, he's saying. But according to the new standards, namely the standards that he is now laying out, uh, they fall far short. Dickens' Pickwick Papers is pure comedy. It is full of witticisms, but contains no hit, hint of indecency in either plot or language, because wit is not founded on bodiness. Okay, so Dickens' Pickwick Papers is a uh, positive example of what we should aim for in the future. It is co comedy, but it is, it is without uh, pornography and indecency, which was were hallmarks of the Edo period. Gesaku. The secret of humor lies in cleverly mixing solemnity, pride, and nobility with stupidity, meanness, and coarseness. One way to raise a laugh is to exaggerate the insignificant or to exalt the lowly. An old retainer's absent-mindedness, the downfall of a haughty person, this is the stuff of which comedy is made. In short, the seeds of laughter are often to be found in situations arising from unintentional mistakes. There is no need to make a joke of coarseness. Okay, so coarseness, bodiness, pornography, these are not necessary to uh, make a successful comedy. The novel of the future will not be like that of the past. It will set out to attract men of discrimination rather than to entertain women and children. So again, this misogyny thrown in there. Men of discrimination on the one hand as opposed to women and children who have no discrimination and who have no ability to uh, judge aesthetic merit and value and so forth, literary merit. 
This means, of course, that even humorous novels will have to avoid plots unworthy of an artist's standard. So, artist standards. Just as an indecent painting unfit for the eyes of family groups cannot be classified as art, no matter how skillful its execution, so too a book which cannot be read aloud to parents and children is not a real novel. Okay, so the um, target of the proper new novel that he's advocating is not women and children, should not be women and children. Nevertheless, uh, it should not be offensive when uh, to women and children when they do happen to read those works. Someone once said that there would be no pornographic literature if public demand did not ensure a ready sale for it. And that is thus, that it is thus, and that it is thus the readers and not the authors who are to blame if novels are a body. Authors merely describe human nature and enjoy social conditions that are appropriate to the times. If their contemporaries are low-minded, if they delight in eroticism, then that will naturally be reflected in the novels of the day. So this is a point that he's made above already, he's reiterating it here, namely that not, the writers themselves are not really to blame if they write low-minded pornographic stuff, it's the audience who demand that kind of stuff. So the, the audience, to a large degree, determines the uh, quality and the content of the novels of any epoch. It is inevitable, he said, because the novel is a mirror of its times. Okay, so he said, okay, uh, his argument is reasonable. His, okay, Dickens, his, who is he referring to his? I think he's referring to Dickens here still. We'll have to confirm this later. His argument, I think Dickens' argument, is reasonable in the main, but not altogether incontrovertible. What he says was true of pre-Meiji novelists, not, no, he's not talking about Dickens, we'll figure this out later. What he says was true of pre-Meiji novelists, whose aim was to entertain women and children with their work, but it was, will not do as a justification for their modern counterparts. As a general rule, this is a line which should not be crossed in dealing with the seamy side of life. While some aspects of it must inevitably form part of any description of human nature and social customs, Others should never be mentioned. Those that are unavoidable should be handled with care. They should be dealt with as briefly as possible, and the rest left to the reader's imagination. In times when morals are lax, for example, many men and women carry on clandestine intrigues, but to lay bare the mysteries of the bedroom and reproduce the details of their conversation there in the name of realism is a task belonging not to the novelist but to the writer of love stories. So again, he's advocating realism, but uh, realism with limits, right? Realism uh, with limitations on uh, proper subjects and with uh, uh, rules about where uh, the realist, the mimetic gaze should go and where it should not go. It should not go into the bedroom and talk about the uh, explicit acts and the conversations of lovers. So he's making a distinction between the writer of love stories and the writer of uh, true novels. What I have just said applies to comic novels as well. Surely it is not really necessary to take their subject matter from the lower classes of society when the people and affairs of the upper classes provide such material for humor. It is understandable that Gesaku writers of the Ikke, so Jibensha Ikke, that we mentioned above, of the Ikke school, who of course were not very highly principled, should have drawn their material from middle and lower class life to amuse their lower class readers. What I really find what I find really amazing, however, is that today's comedy writers, rather than striking out in a new direction, continue to use the same old methods and still consider body jokes the pinnacle of humor. None of them is interested in reshaping the no Japanese novel into an art form, okay, into a lofty art form like uh, <clears throat> the novels of the West. As long as the novel is not considered to be art. It need do no more than provide contemporary readers in a given area with entertainment. Not even the most contemptible story, the most erotic tale, can be criticized. If, on the other hand, one looks upon the novel as a great art form, it will take more than the mere fact that a story has the power to interest people in a certain place and time to earn it that description. 
As I said in part one, true art is beneficial. It moves a man deeply and ennobles his character without being aware, without his being aware of it. Okay. So it's not explicitly beneficial in this sense, but it uh, nevertheless has that effect on people <clears throat> in a subtle way, so that the reader isn't even aware of the fact that he is being ennobled by reading it. Anything which lacks even the least part of this benefit is not art, but merely a commonplace diversion, okay, mere entertainment. He's making a distinction between mere entertainment and high true art. Can the colored woodblock prints, so he's talking about ukiyo-e again, in which the public delight be classified as real painting? They are beautiful, certainly, but it would be wrong to label them indiscriminately as embodiments of the pure essence of art, when their eligibility for such a description must depend on whether or not they have the ability to enrich a man's nature. Okay, so ukiyo-e, in his view, are beautiful, but they do not enrich or ennoble man's nature, therefore they do not qualify for his def for definition of true lofty art. As the artist must strive to paint not merely a pretty picture, but one so beautifully executed that it ennobles the human character in some way, so true the novelist must strive to inspire his reader by the vividness of his portrayal of human nature and social conditions. Ninjo Sitai. No novel which fails to uplift its reader ranks as art, nor does its author deserve the proud title of novelist. Okay, so he's been using this word Shosetsu to refer to works of the past, Gesaka writers, etc., but he's making a distinction between those sorts of lowly uh, sort of pseudo Shosetsu and the true Shosetsu, which has as one of its defining characteristics this ability to uplift or ennoble, ennoble readers. If hesitant authors choose to deprecate themselves as being only Meiji authors or Bunsei Gesaku writers and try to repudiate the title, refusing to consider themselves artists, I do not blame them at all, no matter how much they pander to the interests of children or the lower classes. It is of no consequence. To amuse people in a given time or place is a simple matter. To create an impression on a larger scale is much more difficult. To take an instance from the world of ukiyo-e, Hishikawa Moronobu was a pioneer in their development, the development of ukiyo-e, second only to Iwasa Matabe. Because of that, he was famed throughout the country in his day. Everyone acknowledged him as a master, yet the artists of the world would surely not acquiesce in praising the extremely bad ukiyo-e produced by the followers of that same Hishikawa as masterpieces of elegance. To do so would be to confuse elegance with antiquity. Their example shows how easy it is to win localized contemporary approval and how difficult true art is. Okay, so it's easy to be popular and to win approval, but to produce lofty, timeless art is very difficult and very few, if any, have been able to do this in the past, he is uh, implying here. What I have just said must not be construed as advice to the novelist to ignore contemporary human nature and social conditions and co to confine himself to writing instead about a nobler kind supplied by his imagination. Okay, so he's issuing the, though he's issuing these warnings, uh, he is not saying that we should avoid uh, human nature and social conditions altogether because they're too vulgar and instead uh, represent only idealized pictures of the humans in one's head. He's not saying that. Any historical novel must inevitably contain passages dealing with violence and cruelty, such as those of Bakin, for example. Even a social novel, if its author lived in a society as yet only semi-civilized, would be an even a social novel would be an idealized rather than true picture of life in its times. when the writer lives in a time that's only semi-civilized. The best way to deal with them, I feel, is to include them, but to exercise restraint in their handle handling. So include the semi-civilized elements of your semi-civilized society, but exercise restraint when handling them. If an author feels even the slightest twinge of personal interest in a brutal episode, he will be, able, he will be apt to dwell on the incident to an extent unpalatable so, to some other perceptive detached person. The same applies to pornography. Any eagerness on the author's part to divulge such details becomes obvious from the way he writes about them, causing discriminating readers to lay aside the book. Okay, so 
I guess he's saying here that if it's absolutely necessary to include the sexual aspects of life or of a character, then one must do so in the name of realism. But it's the moment that an author starts to take pleasure in uh, portraying those pornographic or sexual elements, then it, uh, de it devolves into the level, into the realm of pornography, and the discriminating reader should put that work down at that moment. To sum up, while it is not necessary to banish all mention of cruelty or obscenity from the novel, such elements should be kept to a minimum. The intelligent reader should not be wearied with the sort of thoroughly squalid tale hitherto produced by Japanese authors. In the works of the French novelist Dumas, one encounters both barbarity and eroticism, but as he does not expose in full the secrets of the bedroom, unlike our own historical romances, his novels may safely be read aloud to the whole families. Okay, so Dumas passes his test and can be read to whole families. Many of the works of the English novelist Leton, so again, Ernest Maltravers, for example, remember Ernest Maltravers, which uh, was one of, if not the first full novel translated into Japanese around 1870, I think, uh, which sparked a whole wave of imitation works of uh, Seiji Shosetsu, or the political novels that were big in the 1870s, early 1880s, also relate, this work too, also relates stories of love, but he too handles such matters differently from Japanese novelists. The bedroom itself, of course, and any details of such private matters are kept entirely out of the picture. Nothing is made explicit. So this is what we should do, he's saying. Instead, Li Tong f turns his facile pen to exploring every detail of his lover's ardent emotions. His love stories, from the nature of the story to the handling of the plot, resemble those of the Tame Naga school, the, the great uh, Ninjobon writer of the Edo period, Tame Naga Shunsei. They resemble uh, the works of Tame Naga in his school, but they escaped a scornful reception from the English public, not only because of the superior nature of their characters and incidents, but also because of the elegance of his method of description in dwelling not on specific behavior, but on abstract emotions. Future Japanese novelists would do well to make this distinction in their works. Okay, so the distinction between specific behavior and abstract em emotions. And the true, refined, lofty novelist should re focus on abstract emotions. I might just mention here the subject of rape, which occasionally crops up either in passing in the plot of Japanese novels or as the main topic of a historical romance. Human nature and social conditions being what they are, its presence is attributable to them rather than to any fault on the author's part. But it does not enhance the plot in any way. So rape does not enhance the plot. If the omission of rape would detract from the realism of the description, then it must be included. But there is surely no need to describe it frankly as an end in itself. So uh, descriptions of rape should be included only when absolutely necessary, based on the uh, rules of realism. But the, uh, as soon as the writer starts to relish in describing the rape, then it, it devolves to the level of mere pornography. There are many ways of skirting the subject, by making one character tell another that it happened, for example, thereby sidestepping the prurient details. This would be quite a novel method, one which would do justice to both points of view. There are many other such ways to improve a plot. When Japanese novelists want to shed light on the way men and women think, they invariably progress to bedroom matters. This, above all else, must be stopped. I refer to certain to such phrases as although they do not yet sleep together and at first they were afraid and shy but later they became joyous bedfellows. Such things need not to be put into words. So it's too explicit in his view, such phrases. Expressions like slamming shut the door, what dreams they must have dreamed together are always to be found in our novels. They must be worded in any one of the variety of ways, but their ex implication is always deliberately sexual. This is going too far. If an author wishes to make it tacitly understood that the characters in the story are engaging in illicit sex, 
they, he should be able to communicate it from the context without needing to mention uh, doors being closed. Okay, so be Victorian, be prudish, be indirect in your description of any sexual acts that might appear in your plot, in your story. In this connection, it may be said that recent Sewa Kyogen, for note about that, we'll see, look at that later, have been mediocre plots and little artistic appeal. This is because of the lack of ability of the basically unimaginative authors. They have abandoned brutal erotic plots in response to the arguments of thinkers seeking to, seeking to bring about the enlightenment of society, but have had no idea of the kind of pure, carefully crafted plots that should be substituted. All they have done is serve up offerings which are simply ordinary kyogen, from which the erotic elements have been removed. So our kyogen these days are neither accurate portrayals of modern social conditions, setai, nor representations of an ideal society, uh, setai fuzoka. As the events they've described have obviously been contrived by the author, they contain such unlike unlikely incidents as the miraculous recovery of a man who should have died, or a reform of an incorrigible villain. In short, modern kyogen offer neither well-turned and accurate descriptions of contemporary life, nor elegant climaxes wherein are expressed deeply felt emotions. Lacking both, they naturally have nothing in them to interest. Okay, so Sewa Kyogen should be avoided and should be uh, abandoned altogether. Let me now return to my original subject of the comic novel, from which I have just digressed at some length. I have a little more to say about today's so-called comic novel or tragic comedy, as it really is. In tragic comedy, it is the blending of humor and pathos which demands the most careful attention. There is, as a rule, a limit to how much the sensibilities can be taxed, just as the muscles or the power of observation grow tired and weak and temporarily cease to function if used for too long without a break. After staring too long into the radiance of the sun, for example, we cannot see even the light of a candle, and even the strongest perfume seems to have as little impact as water to a nose grown accustomed to its fragrance after prolonged exposure. Likewise, the sensibilities too can be blunted, too many tragic stories will result not only in a gradual weakening of the ability to empathize, but also eventually in boredom. For this reason, it has long been the custom among authors to season tragedy with laughter and season comedy with dashes of hardship and misery in order not to weary their readers. Weary their readers. I do not have the space to explain it all over again, but there is one cautionary note I must sound on the subject. Humor and pathos in a tragic comedy should not be altered, alternated in a mechanical way with none of the charm of the unexpected, or they will make little impression on the reader, no matter how well the proportion of each is regulated. They should be used judiciously. So the use of humor in tragedies and the use of pathos in uh, comedies should not be too formulaic, is what he's saying here. The same applies to tragic novels. Should they encompass nothing but misery, nothing but sadness from beginning to end on the grounds that such should be the primary concern of a tragedy, their readers will eventually become bored. So things should be mixed up a bit, he's saying. The final catastrophe, in particular, should be described simply, with the lightest possible touch. The final uh, catastrophe or denouement in the tragedy he's talking about here. Look at the famous story, Musume Setsuyo, if I know about that. It's denouement is the more unbearably poignant for being so delicately handled. Murasaki Shikibu, in the Kumo Gakure chapter of Genji Monogatai, informs the reader in a roundabout way that Genji is dead. So he's applying these uh, terms from Western, Western literary theory about uh, tragedy and comedy and so forth applying them onto the on literature of Japanese antiquity. So he's uh, considering here this Kumogakure chapter of Genji Monogatai in the terms of Western tragedy, which seems a bit odd to us today, but uh, that's how Japanese of the Meiji period were reading their tradition. Just keep that in mind 
they're filtering everything through the this new lens that has just been imported of Western aesthetic ideas. The care she takes to do so marks her as a great writer. So Murasaki Shikibu meets the standards of this, meets the criterion criteria of this uh, new Western aesthetic paradigm, he's saying. Unlike the Gesaku writers of the Edo period. Many of the Gesaku writers. There is much more I have to say about the plot of the tragic novel. But as I have already gone on too long, I propose to turn now to other matters. I trust my readers will forgive me for not taking this section to its conclusion. Here follows as a guide for authors a list, not exhaustive of course, of the main faults to be avoided in the plot of a novel. They will from time to time discover others which they should not take which they should take their own measures to avoid. One fantasy. I shall not go over this ground again, as I have already explained repeatedly that the true novel shuns absurd nonsense and fanciful extremes of mystery. So fantasy is a bad word. This is an important passage here. I'm going to stop and copy it and uh, quote it in my book. So take a break here. Okay, two, monotony. By monotony, I mean constant repetition of the same sort of idea. Okay, so this is a list of how many things do we have here? We have a list of five items here that should be avoided in the plot. Monotony. By mon monotony, I mean constant repetition of the same sort of idea. Music and poetry are nothing without rhythm. Variety is even more important in the novel, which catalogues the infinite, ever-changing spectrum of human nature and social conditions. So variety is a good thing, monotony is bad. So, number three, redundancy. Redundancy is the repetition of an idea similar to one expressed earlier. As it is a matter often debated with great heat by Japanese novelists, the reader is probably already familiar with the arguments without my joining the fray. So in, in oral traditions, for example, redundancy is necessary as a pneumatic, uh, min, min, what's the word, pneumatic, pneumatic uh, device in order for the readers or the listeners to uh, recall what has happened in the story. But in the civilized modern world, in the civilized modern novel, this is no longer necessary because uh, readers are reading the print and they can always refer back to the previous passage. Mnemonic device is the word I was looking for. Uh, next, after redundancy, is eroticism. Okay, so This is a very key passage. It sort of sums up everything he said up until this point, or a lot of what he said up to this point, about what the new proper novelist who's aspiring to lofty high art uh, should, uh, should avoid. Number four is eroticism. I have discussed this point several times already. Eroticism is to be avoided, but not to the extent of never mentioning liaisons between the sexes. Okay, so it is to be avoided, but not completely avoided. It should appear on when it is necessary to uh, convey these things in the name of realism, since humans are erotic creatures. Occasionally, it should make its appearance there, but never in a direct or vulgar way. I merely expect that an author should not seek personal gratification by writing of the secrets of the bedroom. So if you get the sense that the author is being aroused by what he's describing, or being aroused by the thought of his readers being aroused by what he's describing, then it qualifies as pornography rather than high art, is what he's saying here. Uh, the fifth thing that they should avoid is favoritism. This really applies by characterization to play, to characterization rather than plot, but I shall take the opportunity to mention it now. By favoritism, I mean the attitude of an author towards the character he has created. It may seem rather odd to speak of taking sides and connections with characters who are wholly imaginary, but such being the way human nature works, it is not really strange at all. An author may grow unconsciously attached to a virtuous character, for example, and twist the plot to allow its behavior to continue unblemished when the thread of the narrative really dictates that the person act dishonestly. Or he may sometimes so arrange things that a villainous character is made to perform all manner of wicked deeds. So I think he has uh, in the back of his mind here, 
Baking and his Yomi Hong, uh, in which the, the virtuous characters end up winning at the end. And there's, although uh, usually in Baking's novel, in the first parts, first half of the story, there'll be some ambiguity about the good and ambiguity about the bad characters. Are the virtuous characters truly virtuous? Are the uh, bad characters truly bad? And there's ambiguity, but things are usually settled in the end, where the vir virtuous characters are shown to be completely perfectly virtuous and uh, end up winning in the end, and the uh, non-virtuous, unvirtuous characters end up losing in the end, and the ambiguity is settled. Um, okay, so here he's saying that, yeah, he's repeating, and he made this point earlier when he said that um, characters should be created and then wound up, and then they should um, operate according to their own logic and to the logic of psychology. You'll remember that phrase he used earlier in this work. And the f author should intervene as little as possible, right? The characters, uh, their basic structure should be created by the author. But once that basic structure, the psychological structure is created, they should operate according to their own laws. Continuing. Biographers, as well as novelists, have been known to indulge in favoritism. I guess to continue about this issue of favoritism, which the writer should avoid. Ieyasu's biographer, recounting the Battle of Osaka, would naturally defend Ieyasu's actions, whereas Toyotomi's biographer, describing the same events, would favor Hideyori and his mother and revile the behavior of Ieyasu and his son. If this can happen in histories, which ought to present the unvarnished facts, what hope is there for the novel? So he's arguing against hagi hagiography in both history and in the novel. A novelist may speak good or ill of his characters as he pleases. He is free to portray the behavior of the main objects of his affections, the revered hero, as good and pure in every particular, or conversely to paint the villain utterly black. Should he allow himself a biased attitude, therefore, Meiji society would see the appearance of a crowd of men as holy as the saints who would put Yao and Shung to shame, and the villain so pitiless and cruel they would strike fear into the hearts of Dao Zhi and Jie and Zhou. Japanese authors in the past have shown a marked tendency towards favoritism. No writer whose guiding principle is to observe life as it is, underline that phrase, observe life as it is, a very sort of scientific, uh, positivistic, Darwinian notion of what art should be, which he gets from, uh, well, Zola will come in at, uh, around this time and become very influential in Japan, and the naturalists will emerge out of this motto, this maxim that appears right here, to observe life as it is. No writer whose guiding principle is to observe life as it is and write about it in strictly realistic terms ought to have such a habit of favoritism. But as they pander to the frivolous tastes of women and children, it is inevitable that such bias will occur. Women and children, simple creatures that they are, probably think that heroes are always good and villains always bad. In case of Baking, he's saying, has a kind of womanish or childish view of man that sees heroes as always good and villain in, villains as always bad. Although he doesn't name Baking specifically here. In reality, however, even heroes are sometimes prey to evil passions and even villains sometimes stirred by a conscience. If an author loses sight of this fact, this fact of the uh, sort of ambivalence or ambiguity within the soul of each human being, the heart of each human being, even for an instant in the process of peopling his novel, his characters will not ring true. Take care. Okay, that was five. The fifth thing to avoid. He goes on now. Sixth thing that the true novelist should avoid is patronage. Patronage, too, relates to characterization. It occurs as a result of the favoritism just mentioned. When an author takes his partiality for his hero to extremes, he shelters him and saves him from every threatened danger. The practice is not wrong in itself, of course, since it is only in tragic novels that the hero must die, but things have been very badly managed if the reader takes it for granted that the hero will always be overprotected or rescued from peril. The eight heroes of Hakenden, for example, are wizards who encounter no difficulties and never die. Inue no Masashi, in particular, does not die even though he is killed. 
perhaps because he has the aid of a sacred rosary bead as well as the divine spirit of the guardian angel Fusehime. Thanks solely to Bakin's literary talent, this defect goes unremarked throughout the novel. Any other author would have had the reader yawning and throwing the book away by the 8th or ninth chapter. Some English novelists, Richardson for example, are guilty of patronage. Okay. So the author basically should not patronize or uh, act directly, in, uh, intervene directly into the work in order to save a character who's about to be killed, for example, who's about to die. Uh, uh, do, do ex machina. Do, do ex machina is to be avoided, he's saying. Uh, number seven, the seventh thing to, uh, that the true novelist should avoid is inconsistency. I address myself here to both plot and description. Let me give an example. Shinto Suikoden was begun by Gakute and continued by Chisokkan. So begun by one author and continued by another author. Any inconsistencies are therefore excusable on the whole, but there is one particularly glaring discrepancy which makes a good example because of the unpleasant jolt it gives the reader. Gakute describes Tamaoki Genkuro as swarthy, powerfully built, and round-eyed, whereas Chisokka much later says that he is pale complexion with a straight nose. An astounding contradiction indeed. Of course, Tamaoki first appears in the story as a woodcutter deep in the mountains, so it is quite natural that he should appear dark. But it ought to be explained that this is the result of exposure to the sun. No matter how many years have passed, a rough, uncouth woodcutter cannot be transformed into an elegant ad Adonis. Too, much, too many such inconsistencies will weary the reader and take the edge off even the most interesting plot. 8. The eighth thing to avoid is ostentatious scholarship. Ostentatious scholarship, the flaunting of one's own erudition, is seldom seen in the work of experienced writers. It is younger authors who are often guilty of this abominable practice. They launch into lengthy accounts of past events when danger threatens and give lectures on archaic words in front of their betters who cannot speak out, or they give a character more leaning learning than he might reasonably be expected to have. The most frequent sinner in this regard among the Japanese novelists was Baking. The practice crops up occasionally in some of Lee Tone's earlier works, and even Scott is said to have yielded to the temptation to, ex to some extent in The Pirate, for which he was trounced by the critics. Nonetheless, it would be a great pity if an author's learning were to pass completely unnoticed. He should take care to limit his display of it to occasions when the text of his novel calls for it, so as not to bore his reader. Okay, So you should not show off what your erudition, although it should be evident from the story, from the manner of writing, that you are erudite. So there's a, a fine line that the author must walk between those two extremes. Number nine, too long a story. I'm not referring here to the story as a whole. There's nothing wrong with writing a long story so long as an author provides enough variety in his plot to keep his reader's interest. Variety under this word, word he's used it several times, a very important skill that the uh, author must develop, variety of style. If he delays the progress of the story, variety of plot in this case, in, interminably, in the manner of a professional storyteller, however, the impatient reader may grow tired of waiting and lose all interest in the outcome. The impact of the denouement will be diminished because his attention will probably have wandered to something else by the time it is produced. Okay, so this must keep the writer, uh, the reader, in a state of suspense, but not uh, extend that suspense for too long. Uh, lest the writer become bored, is what he's saying. The following amusing anecdote illustrates my point. Not long ago, a certain prostitute from a brothel in the Shin Yoshiwara took a handsome lover. The lover, thinking to cement their relationship even further by a trick, deliberately kept his distance for a long time in an attempt to increase her longing for him. So in Japanese, modern Japanese, contemporary Japanese, we say hochi pre, hochi pre. 
For more than ten days he paid her no visit. Meanwhile the woman, who had forsaken her trade for, so, for love of him and was even ready to marry him, was in torment, imagining various accidents which might have befallen him. She tried to find out what had happened by sending people to spy on his movements or sending anonymous letters, but he smiled to himself to see his plan in action and from then on only returned commonplace answers once or twice a month. Eventually, he sent not even a postcard. Three or four months passed this way. The woman, who was in the case of, who was in any case of a jealous disposition, thought he had transferred his affections elsewhere. She seemed to feel the first cold breath of an unexpected autumn wind. Jealousy tore at her. Try as she might, she could not forget the words of love they had exchanged in the past. In the months which had already passed, even when dressed to receive patrons, an unceasing rain of unceasing, unseen tears had soaked her sleeve. When still not even the faintest whisper of a message came from her lover, however, she untied the knot of the wanton fickle thread of a court in Zan's love which bound them and entered into a close alliance with another lover. Meanwhile, her former lover had no idea what had happened. When four, mo four months were up, he told himself that the time was ripe, planning to meet her that very day and plan play out the fine stormy scene which would be by turn sad and humorous he went triumphantly to visit her with what little success the reader may deduce for himself had this self-assured paramour practiced his delaying tactics in moderation or would have probably been well he failed because he did not appreciate this fact which is also a key to the novel Novelists, I implore you, keep this example in mind when you write. It's a rather long-winded way of saying that Ho Chi Pure, uh, both in the context of characters in the story and in context of a writer and his relation to the, his readers, Ho Chi Pure should be used in moderation because if taken too far, Ho Chi Pure will end up backfiring. Uh, the tenth thing that the writer should avoid is a lack of poetic interest. This is not at all the term I am looking for, but it will do for the moment. What I really mean is a lack of dramatic sense. What, and you should just say lack of dramatic sense instead of writing poetic sense. But because the novel, instead of saying poetic interest, because the novel is a faithful re reproduction of social conditions, Setai Fuzaka, its plot is apt to be plain and insipid. To avoid this, a novelist should strive to keep his reader's interest by weaving occasional touches of the romance into his plot. A secret feud, for example. I need not elaborate further. Okay, so the social conditions, if uh, portrayed exactly as they are, will become plain and insipid, right? So the writer has to in, uh, include some touches of romance into the plot. So even if the uh, life as it is might be a bit bland, you should put in some dramatic flourishes, a feud, for example, in order to liven things up a bit. Okay, so again, pure realism, total realism, perfect realism is not to be... Uh, aspired to. Okay, so again he's echoing the view that was held by Chikamatsu who says this kind of middle way between perfect realism and perfect uh, fancy, perfect uh, imagination of fantasy and so forth should be, these two extremes should be avoided and you should navigate a middle course between the two and Shoyo is kind of saying the same thing here. Realism is, to, is good but it should not be a strived for in a sort of extreme radical sense. And finally, the eleventh thing to be avoided is making characters relate long personal histories. Okay, so this is uh, in my classes we often talk about uh, the difference in narrative style between uh, telling and showing. Right, Telling is no better in Japanese. The jinobun, the narrative passages, telling. Showing is the uh, conversations, the dialogue between the characters. Okay, so he's saying that uh, extensive no better, extensive telling on the part of characters, or from the narrative's point of view, relating their long personal histories is to be avoided, and we should employ s s adequate amount of showing. Making characters relate long personal histories 
histories. This device, namely of telling too much, not only diegetic is the fancy narratological word for this, this device not only helps to keep the short story short, it has a charm of its own. So di diegetic or telling techniques are of course important and the writer must use it uh, judiciously. It can be used without overdoing things two or three times in a not long novel, but used too often it will provoke sighs of not again from the reader. In works of only a few chapters especially, the less it is used the better, so in short works there should be more showing than telling. That concludes my remarks on the subject of plot in general. There remain several things to be said about the plot of the historical novel, however, which I shall deal with in a separate chapter to avoid making this one too long. Okay, chapter 4 is the next chapter. We'll take a short break before we get to that. Okay, Deus Ex Machina. I think I mispronounced that word uh, in the uh, a few 20 minutes ago or so. So you will forgive my mispronunciation. When one lives in Japan for a long, an extended period, one forgets how to pronounce certain words. Um, you will forgive. Okay, I want to get through these last three chapters as quickly as possible so we don't have to make another video. So here we go. Chapter 4, The Plot of the Historical Novel. Before going on to discuss plot, I propose to say a little about the difference between a historical novel and a history, because unless that difference is clearly understood, the historical novel will, will not be easy to write. I trust the reader will forgive me if I seem to repeat arguments already covered in the earlier sections. There are some who say that although many people read historical novels for pleasure, because they fill in the gaps left by official histories, the seishi, they would lose their attraction were histories to develop to such a stage of thoroughness that we, would, that we could assume there were no omissions omissions. Such an event, they claim, would mean the eventual demise of the novelist who expends his energies on fanciful original fic fictions. Even Ma Macaulay, Macaulay himself, it appears, felt the same way. He often put forward a similar idea in his works and talked about why writers of novels and historical romances would ultimately disappear. It is not only students and scholars who enjoy finding out the details of their country's past, he writes. Even laymen take a certain amount of pleasure in reading history, which of course is as it should be. How can they amuse themselves with the fictions of novels alone? End quote. Surely he is, he is mistaken. There is a vast, more than vast, difference between the so-called authentic histories found in England and what passed for chronicles in the Orient, of course. But it is hard to believe that as matters now stand outside literary circles, a historian's literary style can have more appeal than a novelist's. An aptitude for writing history being, being essentially different from a talent for poetry or fiction, the two are never found in the same person. Macaulay was a talented historian, of course, with a flair of, for poetry as well. There can be little doubt, however, that had he been commanded to write a novel or the, a historical romance, it would have been clumsy and indistinguished. Lord Brougham, Brogham, Brogham, Brav, Brav, Braham, a prominent English lit, uh, historian, actually did write a few novels, but their unwieldy plots and ungraceful style rendered them hardly fit to read. Novelists, on the other hand, suffer no such handicap. Quite a few famous novelists have also written famous histories. Thackeray is one eminent figure whose novels have been brought, who has novels have brought him prominence in recent times. I have heard that on several occasions he produced manuscripts for a history, but dropped the project before publication. I am firmly convinced that he, that had he seen it through, the result would have been brilliant. The four Georges and the English humorists prove beyond doubt that his is no ordinary historian's talent. George Eliot was similarly gifted, and Lord Lytton actually wrote several sections of a history which were well received. Before I go any further, I should spell out just what it is that distinguished novelists from a historian. In the first place, a novelist's penchant for fiction makes him reluctant to record facts in a plain, unvarnished manner. Without consciously realizing it, he introduces a certain amount of literary embellishment and occasionally gets his facts wrong. Lapses into rhetoric are often unavoidable, however, when the topic under discussion is a person. Even Macaulay, 
both in his histories and his biographies, occasionally set down seemingly fanciful, questionable information. Carlyle, who occasionally who enjoys a, case, a considerable reputation in England, was another whose style was exceedingly ornate. It is therefore difficult to distinguish between novelists and historians solely on the grounds that one writes fiction and the other fact. Such masters of the historical as Sir Walter, Sir Walter Scott always base their plots on historical fact, but one reading is enough to make apparent the difference between their works and the history books. It is not just attention to detail or ornateness, ornateness of style which sets the two apart, but the fact that a novel can be both smooth over, they can both smooth over the gaps left in history by supplying missing facts from the author's imagination and also indulge freely in familiarity, by which I mean that when a novelist describes the words and actions of his characters, who are also historical figures, with meticulous attention to detail, he creates in his reader the impression that the novelist and the character as represented in the novel are well known to each other. A historian narrating facts must substantiate every incident. Not so a novelist, who is at liberty to perform the by no means easy task of dissecting human nature as he pleases, to trespass within even the forbidden inner sanctums of court ladies in order to give an account of how those ladies behave there, and to describe what is happening both inside and outside closed gates and doors without having to go into the background of events in any detail. The most important of the differences between a novel and a history is this ability of the novel to fill in gaps. Think, for example, about the fact that the Emperor Napoleon I of France finished his evening meal. No doubt he did finish it, and so he should have, but that point is far too trivial to record in a history. Everyone who has ever read a history of France has imagined that many a melancholy conversation must have preceded the Emperor's divorce from the Emperor jo Empress Josephine. Yet anyone attempting to set down every one of those details which go to make up each event in a history book would be bound to attract criticism on the grounds of over-complexity. These small facts, however, make a deep impression on people. It is precisely because many such trifling matters are pinpointed in unofficial histories and pamphlet histories that readers lay, lap them up. Having no more cherished memories of Napoleon the man than the next person, they are delighted by the feeling of intimate contract afforded by finding out any contemporary information about him. It is very difficult, indeed impossible, to escape the charge of superfluity incurred by recording such minutia in official histories, however, unless the historian possesses an outstanding literary talent. The novelist, on the other hand, is under no such constraint. In order to relate Napoleon's story and to deal fully with the events leading up to his marriage to Marie Louise after his divorce from Josephine, he begins with a time and place of no particular importance and proceeds to fill in the picture by st full picture by stages, luring the reader ever onward to a marvellous climax and causing him to feel that past events have come alive before his eyes. All this lies within his competence. From a novel of this kind, the reader learns that Napoleon sat drinking coffee and chatting with the maids and pages in the depths of his palace. What his responses were, what the maid said to him, and why certain topics upset him. Not only does he find out how the Empress Josephine swallowed the bitterness overflowing her heart and restrained her crushing grief, often brushing away with her sleeve the tears in her eyes, but even the small things are revealed in every particular. How the coffee grew cold as the conversation lengthened, why the bread and butter were left on the table to no purpose with no one to eat them, how someone forced herself to eat just a slice solely to keep up appearances. To report every single one of these details in a history would be impossible. That is the forte of the novel. Okay, this, this is probably the most straightforward and clear uh, section of the entire treatise. So it requires uh, no commentary from me. It's pretty straightforward here. Continuing. It is also very difficult to sketch in such things as clothing and customs in a history, whereas not only does a novelist have every facility to do so, his work is tantamount to a living history of manners. 
Authors like Scott come closest to achieving a true historical novel. While Bucking, Kilden, and others are famous as historical novelists, their works are really more like social novels, perhaps because they carelessly describe not the customs and clothing appropriate to the historical setting, but those of Kung A period and after. The most important thing to remember in writing a historical novel is to keep as much pos as possible to the background of history rather than to its surface. By surface I mean the facts recorded in history books. By background, things which cannot be discovered from that source. Bakin's very clever description of the appearance of the Hogan army in Yumi Harizuki Yumi Harizuki it comes close to achieving the effect of a fictional biography. Also very clever is his ferreting out and detailed describing of all the Hojo Tokimasa's inner wickedness in Asai na Shima Meguri no Ki. It's probably even, it is probably even true to say that Kyoka Kuden and Bisho Nendoka by Baking uh, qualify as outright historical novels from this point of view. To sum up, the aims of the historical novel are to fill in gaps in both histories and histories of manners. To attain even one of these goals is sufficient. While an author is under no compulsion to use the great events and characters of history, a story centered on historical fact, backed up whenever possible with accounts of customs and reminiscences, is truly whole and perfect. Authors of historical novels are prone to many weaknesses, of which the chief are chronological inconsistencies, factual errors, and misrepresentation of customs. Even historians sometimes make mistakes in chronology. chronology. While slight errors may not seem a matter for any great concern in novels, which are fictitious, they are nevertheless undesirable and should be eliminated whenever possible, because regardless of how elegant and realistic the story may be, a perceptive reader will notice marked discrepancies at once and lose the feeling that he has entered a dream world and is communing with the ancients. Japanese novelists in the past have not placed much importance on chronological inaccuracies. Some have even openly advised their readers not to worry about them. Others like Bucking, as might be expected, paid scrupulous attention to dates so that those who call Hakkendeng and Shima Meguri no Ki historical novels are re not really so far wide off the mark. I recall, however, that there were quite a few mistakes in Kyokakuden, Kyokakuden, an outstanding work. Factual errors involve making mistakes in historical data, describing a good man as a villain, for example, or vice versa. Japanese novelists are often guilty of this crime, although someone like Bakim would have done their best to avoid it. It must certainly be eliminated because the main purpose of the historical novel is to relate behind the scenes information about historical events and personages. personages. This of course it cannot do with any degree of conviction if the external facts on which the story is based are inaccurate. No historical novel is perfect as long as it contains such errors. No matter how clever its plot or, a or accurate its description of customs, a story dealing fully with customs but based on fictitious characters with no recourse at all to historical fact would be preferable. An author misrepresents customs by describing anachronistic utensils, furnishings, customs, ornaments or foodstuffs, or by taking for granted in the story customs which did not exist in that era making an Ashikaga period character smoke cigarettes or play the samisen, for example, or one from the Hojo period, fire a gun or wield a lance. A further instance of this sort of carelessness would be to have a woman of the Keicho era do up her hair in a Shimada top knot or wear a kimono with long trailing sleeves. There are other much worse cases. I mention these only by way of example. Inaccurate record reporting of customs, like the inclusion of factual errors mentioned earlier, is a grave fault in a historical novel, one which, if not eliminated, will prevent the realization of its goals. How unfortunate it is that even a great writer like Baki not only sinned frequently in this respect, but made no attempt whatever what to reform. I guess our history should be appreciated. Uh, and acknowledged as such. So uh, we can imagine that Tsubo Shoyo would be very much against many of the uh, 
films that have come out in recent years that address a topic or subject from the historical past, but do so without any respect for the historicity of those time periods and uh, write the dialogue and so forth in a modern American vernacular and so forth. All right, that's the end of chapter four. Next we have chapter five, which is fairly brief, and then the final concluding per, uh, chapter, which we should be able to finish by in a few minutes. So let's take a short break here. Okay, we're almost done now. Chapter five, the hero. The hero is the central character of the novel. He may also be called the idol. While there is no restriction on how many heroes a novel may have, sometimes there is only one, sometimes there are two, more than two, there must be at least one, because without him the continuity it needs would be totally lacking. There must be one hero. Uh, Because the novel, dealing as it does with human nature and Indo, must of course express the views of both sexes. The central character may be either male or female, designated hero and heroine, respectively. A simple example of such a pair occurs in Bakin's Kyo Kakuden, where Kuroku Sukenori is the hero and Kusunoki Koma Hime is the heroine. I need not elaborate further. Historical romances with intricate plots sometimes have many sets of central characters. In Liton's Rienzi, Rienzi, Nina is paired with Rienzi. Irene with Adrian and Adeline with Montreal. Occasionally, a novel may have a hero but no heroine, or vice versa. Yoshihide, heroine, a hero of Asai na Shima Meguri no Ki, has a female counterpart, while Tsui Chao, a heroine of Tsui Chao Ji, adapted by Bakin as King Gyodeng, King Gyodeng, lacks a male partner. These two examples are not really satisfactory. However, as nothing better suggests itself to me just now, they will serve my purpose for the time being. Sometimes there are many heroes present at the same time, as in Hakken Den, Shima Meguri no Ki, Ouji Jisan Den, Nishikyu Gyo Shiden, and Shui Hu Zhuang. In novels of this kind, however, the heroes are naturally ranked, one being, as it were, the central hero, Asaina in Shima Meguri no Ki, and Dien, Rienza in, uh, Dienz, Dienzi in Dienzi. Here follow uh, a few examples to help those not familiar with these ideas. Shiranui Monogatai, Hiro Aoyagi Harunosuke, Heroine Wakana Hime, Jiraiya Monogatai, Heroes... Uh, Ogata Shuma, o- Orochi Maru, Heroine Tsunade, in Bisho Nendoku we have Hero Sue Harukata, Heroine Kogane, in Yumihari, Yumihari Zuki we have Hero Tame Tomo, and Heroine Shira Nui Hime. Japanese novels often do not make clear just who is a hero and who is not. Kohata Nobuyuki and Inaba Onikado are the central heroes of Shin- Shinto Suikoden. Suikoden, the others are secondary heroes. Most people reading a novel want to pay more attention to the characters of its hero than to the possible outcome of plot. A hero above the common run of men elicits respect and a desire to know what will happen to him. As well as fashioning a clever plot, therefore, it is also necessary to provide a distinguished hero capable of stimulating the reader's interest. He need not always be a man who combines wit and good looks with virtue, so long as he possesses unusual qualifications which will impress and interest the reader. The central character may be even be an ugly villain, such as the heroes of Bisho Nendoka and Jingping Mei, or an ill-favored woman like Kakine Oiwa. Mean, foolish characters or cowards should be avoided, however, because not only do they fail to attract the reader, they are highly likely completely to destroy his interest in the story of their misdeeds. Such heroes are sometimes very successful in comic novels, so there is no reason not to use them in that sphere, but serious novels should avoid them whenever possible. I just said now that an author may make his hero ugly and wicked if he wishes. Should he do so, however, he must also introduce a good hero to provide as much contrast as possible. In Bisho Nendoka, Bakin used Morishiro Masakatsu as a foil for the wicked Sue Ake no Suke. The filial Shido Doka in Myo Myo Guruma contrasts with the bad son Madodoka 
and Shirayama Yuki, Kawa and Jidai, Kagami with Fuji, Nami, Yukari, all of them are born of this need, mainly because variety is essential to the plot. The plot of the novel, as indeed do all fine arts, requires a heterogeneous design and coherent plot plan. Even a scrupulously careful plot with a clearly connected sequence throughout will not stop a reader from eventually wearying of and abandoning a tale with no variety of ideas, where the doings of ugly, evil characters fill every chapter, or the only descriptions are of, a, of despicable, mean-spirited scoundrels. On the first day, the head of a condemned man is exposed on a gibbet. Men and women of all ages and ranks fall over each other to get there. They gather like ants to gaze upon a dreadful face. After a few days, though, all alike frown upon it, and hardly anyone looks at the head, let alone the gibbet. The human appetite for the curious being very strong, man takes pleasure in a thing's novelty regardless of its merits or appearance, but very rarely does he cherish ugliness and evil more than beauty and goodness. Indeed, he is born with a love of beauty. A passion for ugliness is merely a reaction, an anomaly, whose essential irregularity makes its fascination short-lived. That is why the novel cannot do without both a good and bad hero. A good and a bad hero. Aoto no Seki Boom was written by Baking's acquaintance King Gyo and checked over by Baking. Neither its style nor its design is ill devised, but such is the unmitigated villainy of its sympathetic, unsympathetic main characters that the reader has no inclination to continue past the first three or four parts. Every single character, from the hero Nakusa Geki Sai, who overthrew Murai Chowang, and the hero Oreki, to the others, is a contemptible bandit whose every action serves only to fill the reader with disgust. Kumano Tanzo, along, um, alone among them, has an upright character, but his goodness is not of an order to match the wickedness and cruelty of Geki Sai and the others. The book falls down on this point. It is a serious weakness which authors should ordinarily take pains to avoid. There are two schools of thought on the matter of inventing a hero. One favors realism, the other idealism. The proponents of the former take as hero an actual person, by which I mean they build a fictitious hero around the personality of an ordinary man from contemporary society. Okay, underline this, these two words, realism and idealism, because this will form the basis of the realism slash versus idealism debate that would take place in the late 1880s between Subotsoyo Soyo and Moriogai, I think. Uh, at any rate, it's a, it's a key fault line in Meiji literature, this division between realism and idealism, different writers uh, advocating uh, dif uh, different uh, aspects of these two uh, poles, binaries. Uh, the Tame Naga school of Ninjobong writers used this method, the former, the realism method. The idealist method, on the other hand, is to create a fictitious character based on the ma way man's nature ought to be. Okay, so this distinction between is and ought, between normative and uh, between descriptive and normative, uh, representational and uh, prescriptive. The essential difference between the two streams is that the realists take as their material ordinary men, the idealist men as they should be. Within the idealist school itself, there is a further subdivision into the hereditary, heredity, deductive method, and the environment, or inductive method. The deductive method creates the characters of the hero as they appear in the book by dissecting and analyzing in minute de detail an ideal nature which has already been decided upon. Bakin often used this method for his heroes, the deductive method, most notably the eight dog knights of Hakken Deng and Sanketsu in Shima Meguri no Ki. He uses the her heredity or deductive method. They inherit these qualities and they uh, express them in their actions. The eight dog knights are imaginary characters in whom the metaphysical characters of benevolence, justice, Courtesy, wisdom, sincerity, loyalty, filial piety, and obedience, the eight Confucian virtues, are separated out and applied to the physical world. In other words, the eight abstract rules of conduct are embodied in tangible human form. 
Likewise, the three heroes of Shima Meguri no Ki, Yoshihide personifies in Yoshihide personifies courage, Minamoto Kanja Yoshikuni benevolence, and Mitsu Naka wisdom. While the deductive method is very interesting, if the author is not sufficiently selective, he will sometimes create bizarre apparitions which seem like human beings but are not. The eight heroes of Hakken Deng are rare, strange beings who resemble the saints and sages themselves, perhaps because Bakin based them on philosophers' theories, namely Confucian theories. While the deductive, or Shu Shi, right, of uh, the Neo Confucian school, founder of Neo Confucianism, while the deductive method should not be dismissed out of hand on this account, it would be highly improper to use it to recreate known historical personages in historical novels. A Sainai Yoshihide, for example, is an actual historical figure, not a fictitious character. One cannot therefore justify manufacturing his actions and words in a way as arbitrarily to embody courage in his person. As I have already said in an earlier chapter, the aims of the historical novel are to fill in the facts omitted from histories and give the reader the subtle impression that he is in close contact with historical figures. When the Asaina Asai, Asaina Yashihide of the story is made to personify courage, he is no longer the Asahina, Asaina Yoshihide of history. The name is the same, but the person is different. Leaving aside for the moment the effectiveness of the device and looking at it from a theoretical point of view, it is inexcusable for an author to use the deductive method to willfully recre recreate a historical figure in accordance with his own arbitrary opinion. Indeed, to do so is to forget the first principle of the historical novel. Keikoku Bidan, recently translated by Yano Fumio, has recently criticized has been criticized by a certain scholar because its three heroes symbolize wisdom, moral integrity, and emotion. If this is so, it seems somewhat less satisfactory. Epaminondas and Pilopidas are actual historical figures, not creations of their author. An author using the inductive method, on the other hand, creates his characters by using his own imagination to select and judiciously compound a collection of various characteristics found in living men. As he relies for the most part on experience and observation to help him formulate those characteristics which will make up elements of people's personalities, he does not, like those who apply the deductive method, become so carried away with empty theorizing that he is Characters bear no resemblance whatsoever to real human beings. Most 18th century novelists, including Britain's Scott, use the inductive method. Litton and others also seem devoted to it. The realist approach, unlike the two methods just mentioned above, just mentioned, involves taking real people as heroes, Tanjiro in Umegoyomi by uh, Tamenaga Shinsei, for example, and Prince Genji in Genji Monogatari. There must have been many people like Tanjiro in Shinsei's day, and many men of rank like Genji in Lady Shikubu's day. For that reason, indeed, inferior scholars of the classics have called Genji Monogatari a didactic work, although it is not, as Moto Ori Norinagara, Norinaga explained in the, uh, his treatise, which was cited uh, in this work in a previous video we talked about this. For that reason, indeed, inferior scholars of the classics have called Genji Monogatari a didactic work and spread it about that each of its male and female characters represents a contemporary figure. They are very much mistaken. They have failed to realize that Lady Shikubu was using the realistic approach to characterization. Okay, so here we see this idea that Genji Monogatari was the, one of the, uh, the world's first uh, realist novel. One may sum up the two techniques by saying that whereas it is easy to enter the gate of the realist school but not so simple to ascend to its chambers, it is difficult to gain entrance to the idealist school but once again it is easy to enter into its chambers. The former concentrates on describing human nature as it is so that the author is under no compulsion to devise his own standards of perfect beauty and goodness with the latter on the other hand is the author himself who contrives the criteria for beauty and ugliness and dreams up his own good and bad characters. The foremost difficulty he faces, however, is that if he does not set his standards high enough, the plot will often be the worst for it, and if he sets them too high, his characters will be not be convincing. If his standards are just right, 
the rest will follow easily from his own ideas. Those who employ the realist method, on the other hand, face their worst difficulties after the gate has been breached. The realist school may be compared to a painter painting a human form, the idealist who painting an angel. Many can paint the human form, but few can manage it with divine skill. Few can paint an angel, but many of those who are able to move people but many of those who can are able to move people with their portrait. It all goes back to the basic difference between truth and falsehood. As I have already discussed in part in chapter three of part one, the aspect of characterization which requires most care on the part of an author is that his own personality traits should not be incorporated into his characters to emerge in their behavior. If he attempts to create fictitious characters based on his own nature, he will of course end up with nothing more than a clutch of identical types, which in the end will give a false ring to the story. The reader will grow bored and lose his sense of participation of disporting himself in the dream world. Many inexperienced writers are prone to this fault, which renders Chi Henjing and Wagou Jing, despite their interest, interesting plots, totally unable to compare with Hisa Kurige in quality by uh, Yip Beng, which we discussed above, Kiza Kuriga. All the libertines in Shi Henjing, with the single exception of Wajiro, are so similar in nature that they seem like the same person. Birds of a feather flock together, true, but it is hard to believe there could be people whose actions and words are as similar as that. If it were not for the fact that they have individual names, Shi Henjing would be no more than a nominal title for a book with an apparent population of only two or three. Most of the words and actions portrayed bear the stamp portrayed bear the same stamp rather than seeming to belong to seven individuals because the whole thing resembles a soliloquy by the author. The toy which little girls play with the actor with one hundred faces exemplifies the principle. Okay, so it's not right works that are mere soliloquies, even if they take the guise of several characters. One can think of, for example, Dazai Osama's Novels written four decades later, in which there are many characters, but they're all kind of various aspects of his own face, so that they can all be read as uh, biographies, as, uh, autobiography, even works such as Hashire Meros. Uh, to exemplify the principle, in a bushy head wig, it looks like Ishikawa Goemon, in a priest's wig, like Yoko Kawa Kakunori, in a tombag. Tombogami, like Yojiro the monkey trainer, and in a Shimada top knot, like Hanako the temple dancer. The facades are different, but it is always the same person underneath. Careful scrutiny of the toy reveals that under all its disguises is a cheap trinket, which makes it only something to entertain a little girl's undemanding eyes. Its novelty is certain not of an order to impress adults and scholars. Writing is an extremely difficult task. In both essays and descriptive compositions, a great deal of thought must be given to an ordering of, ordering of structure and design, neither of which can be carelessly treated. Writing a novel is most difficult of all. Unlike other ordinary forms of writing, the novel requires more than a frank description of the author's own thoughts and feelings. Its duty is to hide those as well as to as it as well as it can, so that they do not show. Okay, so again, the bulk kind of the novelist should hide himself and not reveal himself. And of course, the Japanese three decades later, beginning with the Watakshi Shosetsu, would ignore this advice altogether and begin to write exhibition, self-exhibitionist novels. Uh, it still needs to hide those as well as it can, so that they do not show. To portray vividly and with animation, human nature ninja, as it exists in other people in its infinite, infinite variety. Ordinary writers write like experienced public speakers. For them to inspire their readers by conveying their own wholeheartedness, wholehearted enthusiasm through their writing is both to meet their obligations and also to turn in a fine performance. Were a novelist to seem like an orator, however, he'd be doing a very bad job. Okay, Ishikaju makes this point in Bungak Taigai, one of the essays from that, that the writer is not an or orator, a mere orator. Even worse if he had anything of the puppeteer about him. Okay, so the characters should not be puppets either. They should have agency of their own that is uh, distinct from the intentions of the author who created them. 
He should write in the manner of a creator, with a capital C, a god, amusing himself with all the human beings in creation. If this is beyond him, then he will most nearly approach mastery by acting like a clever magician who makes insensate objects run or leap about from some distance away. To put it briefly, allowing the reader to become aware of the relationship between the novel's author and its characters is the height of incompetence. Anyone attempting to write a novel must take into account this crucial point. Okay. So the author, like a god behind his creations, should uh, be invisible. There should be a sharp distinction between being, with a capital B, the author, and beings, his beings, to put it in the uh, terms of uh, Thomas, the theologian. Okay, final chapter. Chapter 6, Narrative. This is a very short one. We can get through this very quickly, hopefully. Yes, two pages, good. Finally, last chapter, 6, Narrative. I use the term narrative here to embrace all the non-dialogue parts of the novel, whether accounts of the background to characters and events or descriptions of temperance, temperament and scenery. The narration of past events sometimes demands brevity, sometimes detail. While he cannot predetermine his reader's reaction, an author should, of course, guard as much as practicable, practicable against boring him with an overabundance, overabundance of detail. Historical novels, however, must necessarily begin by giving the reader some idea of the quality of human nature and events at the time in question. It would be wrong to insist that such particulars be arbitrarily curtailed merely to avoid the charge of overcomplexity. The long historical account at the beginning of Hak Gen Den and the two or three chapters of factual information usually found in Scott's historical novels are no doubt prompted by this necessity. So some details is necessary, but over abundance of details uh, is not good. To begin with an unadorned lengthy recitation of facts, though, would probably weary the reader. Some other acceptable device must be found to sketch in the background for him. Bakin hit on an excellent idea in Bisho Nendoka when he had a large snake speak of contemporary events, human nature and social conditions, rather than setting them down in narrative form. So snake gives all this essential uh, background information and details, historical detail. Leaving aside for a moment the quality of the book as a whole and looking at it in the light of the work Bakin put into it, one can indeed see in Bisho Nendoka a novel device for making sport of the eccentricities of the times. Bakin's so-called technique of abbreviation may also be applied to narration. Used properly, so abbreviation, remember, is one of the uh, techniques that he uh, delineated above. Used properly, the effectiveness of abbreviation is undeniable. To avoid redundancy, I shall not go into details here. Think about it yourselves. Description needs as much detail as possible. Authors of Japanese novels in the past have been content to rely on miniature illustrations to make up any descriptive deficiencies in the text, often not bothering with verbal depictions of people and scenery at all, but in this they have made a grave mistake. The charm of the novel is not confined to bringing only its characters to life, its object to, is to bring the, uh, the whole of creation into it, play on paper. Okay, we are reminded, for example, of the travel writings of Matsuo Basho, for example, in his High Burn, right, which has often has many characters in a rather short work, but these characters are not fleshed out, they're not given full characterization, they're very flat characters rather than round characters, mainly because the purpose of these works was not uh, characterization, it wasn't to depict these other characters in the works. That wasn't the focus of the work, but uh, Shoyo here is arguing that that should be the focus of the work, and that we must begin to flesh out these characters in a way that we haven't done in the past. The charm of the novel is not confined to bringing only its characters to life. Its object is to bring the whole of creation into play on paper. One of its abilities, the novel's abilities, is to make its thunder rumble, its raging seas mount up to the skies, its nightingales wobble, and its plum blossoms perfume the air. To describe only the attitudes of its characters to the exclusion of inanimate objects is like drawing an ascending dragon without clouds. 
Okay, so he's talking about the description of landscape, which really appears here in the Meiji period for the first time. In uh, one thinks of Karatani Kojin's famous description about the invention of landscape in the Meiji period. This division of self and nature, which didn't really exist in the past, so there was no need to describe a nature as out there, as distinct from in, from the self, right? So through the creation of landscape, or the invention of landscape, that is out there separate from oneself, uh, Karatani argues that um, the Japanese came up with this idea of, or were able to construct this idea or this space of interiority for the first time in their history. That's a topic for another day though. Let's get through this. There are two ways of describing a person's character. I shall call them the negative method and the positive method. The former, used by most Japanese novelists, the negative methods, indirectly makes a character's nature known through his speech and conduct rather than by stating it frankly. The latter, favored by Western novelists, so straightforward description, or telling rather than showing, acquaints the reader from the beginning with a character's disposition by describing it openly. See the section describing Princess Nina in part 7 of the Rienzi. The positive method is probably more difficult to use than the negative. One needs a knowledge of the main points of psychology and a grasp of the principles of physiognomy and phrenology to succeed. So this is again the 19th century, phrenology is still fairly popular. And uh, he's, it's the language of science and psychology should be used in order to describe directly in the in direct diegesis uh, the characters of the story. He's arguing for the importance of telling direct diegesis. One should not, however, make an, any hasty assertions about the relative merits of the two. An author should use whichever seems appropriate to the occasion. If the positive method is not skillfully used, subtle nu nuances will be lost, while mishandling of the negative method hinders discussion of the central issues of human nature. Okay, this is interesting that he calls showing the negative method, showing and telling, but these two uh, terms that often appear in literary studies, he refers to showing as the, the negative method and telling as the positive method. And he may at, uh, while misunderstanding of the negative method hinders discussion of the... so both are important. Authors may ponder their relative merits by examining the ancient and modern historical romances of both East and West. I have not yet exhausted my topic, but I am being hurried by the bookstores, and I do not think it possible to complete my discussion, which could go on forever within a set time limit. I shall therefore lay my pen down here for the time being and fill in the, later, in the gaps in the later supplement. It would please me greatly if the reader, instead of criticizing my uncompleted argument and disorganized writing, would communicate to me his opinions regardless of whether or not they agree with my own. Okay, so he ends the work in typical Japanese fashion of saying, yeah, I have a lot more to say here, but we're running out of time. The editors are hounding and pounding out my door, so let's end it here. So it ends in abrupt fashion. Okay, the notes, we have lots of notes here. We went over the first 27 or so uh, in the first video. Let's see. Okay, we're not going to have time to go over. There's too many notes. We'll have to go th over these in class. Look them over for now. Familiarize yourself with the important names and uh, authors and works that appear in this work. Many of them appeared repeatedly, so we start to get a sense of uh, the what... Um, literary context Shoyo has in mind when he wrote this treatise, the works from both Europe and Japanese tradition. Okay, that is all for now. In the next video, this ends our series, the four-part recitation of uh, this work, but in another separate video I will make a, a study guide in which we delve into this work and its ideas a little more deeply and talk about that. That is all for now. Goodbye.